You have to remember his name. This cool little logo and color scheme um, indicates that we are at the Dutch PHP Con 2015, and it's in Amsterdam. For those of you who were at one of the more recent Drupal Cons, this is actually exactly the space where we had Drupal Con last year. So for me, it's a sort of a homecoming. Have you been here before, Josh? I have been to Amsterdam many times, but I've not been to this particular space. Okay. So, yeah, right? Yes. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course. Okay. So why don't you introduce yourself okay. and tell us one thing about yourself. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Josh Holmes. Uh, I work at Microsoft. Uh, you can find my blog at joshholmes.com. Twitter is Josh Holmes. Uh, I'm obfuscated on the web. Kind of hard to find sometimes. J-O-S-H-H-O-L-M-E-S. Uh, so one thing about me, um, I'm actually a vintage motorcycle mechanic who pays the bills by working for Microsoft. So that is that is what I do. Wow, okay. <laughs> it sounds like you've got your priorities the right way around. Yeah, yeah well, you know, it's, it's, it's you know. Anything on two wheels, uh, so mountain biking, um, you know, motorcycles, um, you know, anything on two wheels is, is kind of what, you know, anything that blows my hair back. Cool, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. With this <laughs> hair back. Yes, this, this, this hair. <laughs> Absolutely. What's your job title? So I am the director of architecture for the partner catalyst team in the developer experiences team. Which It's a long ass title. Right. It's a super cool title, <laughs> yes. and, and I'd like to get to that title and what you do right. in a moment. Talk about your history in software. My history in software. So um, way back when, uh, starting back in, uh, uh, well, longer ago than I want to talk about, the, um, I was actually majoring in drama in college. And uh, that's actually my degree. My degree is in drama, English lit, and radio communications. I had plan A all set up. I was going to go work in a little public theater in Pittsburgh. And there was a radio station that wanted me for the midnight to 4 a.m., you know, the between the sheets hours, you know, the, hey, Angie, this one goes out from Johnny. That's the voice they wanted, right? And then I got married, and I had a kid, and plan A is gone. <laughs> Well, there were bills to pay. There were bills to pay. It's forced maturity as one of my uh, original. Okay. Yes. Because <laughs> I looked at both of those jobs, and both of those jobs were going to pay about $10,000 each. <laughs> and so, and I found a job in computers uh, that was going to pay me 25000 or 28000 which was, you know, to, to borrow a phrase from the South, um, originally from Arkansas, um, uh, that's tall cotton. Okay. <laughs> what was that job? Uh, so I started out working uh, in banking software, uh, in COBOL software development. And the uh, short version is, is that um, they, they could not find comp sci majors who were willing to do COBOL. It was beneath them. But they were looking at the year 2000 like a double barrel shotgun and they were terrified. Y two K, <laughs> and so they were hiring all these liberal arts majors to um, uh, teach them COBOL programming, so they could come fix the Y two K bugs. And uh, so they they hired me. They put me in a three month training course, and um, I failed the course, but I kept my job because, uh, as my um, manager told me at the time, Josh, we really like how you think outside of the box. And I went box. What box? Tell me about this box. How big is the box? Can I stand on the box? What color is the box? Oh, so you're Mr. Edge Case, right? From the I beginning. had no idea what the box was, but I solve problems. And that's really, you know, when, when it comes down to it, I, that's what developers do. They solve problems. And um, so I was solving problems and I figured out that I absolutely loved telling computers what to do and I hated the mainframe. Okay. And so, because I mean, my typical day was uh, uh, come in, pull a bug, write the three, you know, find the, the you know, where it was, write the three lines of code to fix it, submit for compile. Now, this is a foreign concept for people who, A, you're not using compiled languages, and B, 
are used to compiling on their own machine. <laughs> we were submitting to compile on the mainframe and it could take four hours in the queue for it to get to the point where it would compile your application and then it would send back a dump report, which was about this thick of a uh, ream of paper in hex that you had to read through in hex. Hated that part. Loved telling computers what to do. So I went out and picked up a book on Delphi. Okay. <laughs> and then I, then I, then I discovered JavaScript and then I discovered Perl and then I discovered uh, a number of other languages and was very excited. Um, and then I moved to a different division in the same company that was doing, uh, so I was doing, doing all those languages on, on the side because I love doing the stuff, but I hated the mainframe. So, um, I switched to a different group within the same company doing, uh, at the time, Visual Basic 5 and C++. And then, uh, you know, I learned, um, uh, mainframe, oh, sorry, not mainframe. You know, I already knew mainframe programming, but I learned, uh, HP Unix, uh, which is our backend box, uh, Oracle Tuxedo for middleware, uh, learned a whole bunch of great things. Um, then I moved out on my own and I started doing consulting and training. Um, I did a lot of, I did, uh, for four years, I, I kind of made my bones in the industry doing XML training. If you remember XML? Sure, so, of course. So it's kind of popular for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I taught a five day class on XML. Okay. Which is kind of a misnomer because I actually taught XML in an hour and then we spent four days and seven hours teaching all the other standards and how to program against it and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Eventually, I came around and I started doing a lot more web programming. And so I did a lot of ASP.NET for a while, then I started doing Ruby, then I started doing PHP, and then I started doing a whole bunch of other stuff. And eventually, um, Microsoft noticed me because I was, uh, being, being social, being, you know, a liberal arts major. Uh, I started a lot of user groups. I started a lot of conferences and Microsoft tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hey, Josh, uh, we should pay you for what you're doing. And I said, okay. And I joined Microsoft about nine years ago. So there are two intersections that I want to hear a little bit more about. How and when did you encounter open source software? Um, it's a great question. The first on record talk that I have for me, because I mean, it's one of those, I can't even remember when I started doing open source. Uh, but the first talk that I did where I was using open source very heavily was 2001. Uh, so that's makes me old. And <laughs> the same year Drupal was open sourced. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I, I was, I was doing .NET stuff, but I was using a project called Mono and, um, using a, uh, IDE called Sharp Develop, which was an alternative to, uh, Visual Studio. And Mono was .NET running on non-Windows platforms. Oh, how interesting. Yes. So Xamarin, that's where Xamarin started. If you've ever seen, seen Xamarin, Xamarin is a cross-platform, um, uh, application development, you know, for front end stuff. Okay. So, you know, they do, um, Android and iOS and mm -hmm. they sure. started, yeah. they started in the mono project and that was running .NET on non windows. So it was, it was .NET for Linux and for, uh, for the Mac. You've sort of, at least for the last 14 years have really surfed, uh, you know, maybe one foot in open source land and one foot in proprietary land. Yes. Can you compare and contrast the two worlds? Mm. Maybe in terms, um, in practical terms, but also in terms of mentality? Right. Um, it's, a, it's a tough question. To be honest, that, that, that is a tough question. It's one of those, the, let's go back to, I like to solve problems. And there are some problems that, um, I think are best solved with, with open source. And there are some problems that it doesn't really matter. And because it's, it's internal to a company and it's never going to leave and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, or there are occasions where proprietary software that you sell is, is, is useful and interesting as well. Of course. Um, there is innovation that happens there. There is innovation that happens in open source. Um, and it's been interesting watching the interplay between the two early on. Um, most of the open source projects that I saw were copying existing proprietary systems. And I mean, Linux was a copy of Unix, 
right? I mean, and, and there wasn't a tremendous amount of innovation there other than it was free. Okay. As Which was of, hugely innovative. No, no, no. That, that, is, that is important. That is important, right? And, uh, and, 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 and free not necessarily in cost, but, you know, free as in love and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it was... Um, uh, there's a lot of good things there that came out of that. Um, of late, I've seen a tremendous amount of innovation in the open source space, and it's been awesome to watch. Um, and, and of late, it means the last six or seven years, really, in my opinion, um, where we've seen just a, a an incredible surgence of uh, crazy innovation in the DevOps space, in the um, uh, front end space, you know, so Angular and uh, React and Ember. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in love with those as, as, as front end platforms. Um, you know, there's just been a tremendous amount of innovation there that has come about because we have so many people that are starting to innovate together. Um, that- I also think today's, uh, today's, young hot developers we mm-hmm. have at least one if not two generations yep. who've grown up with open source always having existed yes and i uh it's, I got, it's gotten beyond a religion which right, is where it's a, it was it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, com- it's a commodity reality this is how things are done this is how things are done right and which is awesome and but one of the things that it that it shifts and this has been an interesting shift at microsoft um, is because uh, I think that was one of the other intersections that you wanted to talk about a little exactly. bit. Is um, at Microsoft we have uh, and, and, and Satya is the one who's really brought this together. Um, I mean, if you look back, um, uh, Rayazi started to introduce a lot of these concepts and and started pushing us in this direction. And then um, uh, Satya though has really solidified a lot of this, in my opinion. Um, we are moving and transitioning from a company that sells things in boxes to a services-oriented company, and not not consulting services, but you know, we, a consumption-based company. In other words, um, one of the, the ways that Microsoft has always made money is selling things like SharePoint that nobody uses. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's it's in all the companies, but you'll end up buying a hundred licenses and you'll use four of them, right? That world goes away <laughs> in a consumption-based selling mechanism, which means that unless you're actually using it, you're not paying for it. And so it's really an interesting shift because it means that A, we have to build things that people are going to use. <laughs> and B, we are no longer just, you know, the sales model goes away. The original, you know, the, the, the consulting services model that we have goes away. The, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that go away and it brings in and opens the door for all this stuff can be open source because what really matters is we're able to run it better than anybody else. Okay. And so we now have a platform and a, and a, and a system and a set of servers and, a, and, a, and an entire infrastructure that allows us to spin up things at incredibly massive scale and a scale that's, that's unlike almost anybody else in the industry. I mean, there's kind of, there's three major cloud providers out there. There's AWS, there's us, and there's Google. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, there are others, but they, they're, they're, they're kind of for the back. So now I want, um, so you start working for Microsoft nine years ago. Yes. And that's old Microsoft. Yes. That's, we own the desktop, um, all proprietary all the time. The sales model that you were talking about, very, very, very product focused. Mm -hmm. Being in Drupal for the last, um, gosh, 10 years, Mm -hmm. during that time, Microsoft appeared at a lot of our events and did a lot of sponsorship and a lot of talking and introduced a lot of us to to Azure, for mm-hmm. example. And um, I was at Microsoft headquarters in Vienna a few years ago, mm-hmm. and they were talking about, we are about to change. There's a new generation of management. We are aware of open source. Um, and I think we're seeing it come to fruition now. Part, you know, parts of .NET are open sourced, and you have your team, and I want you to tell us what you do in a minute, right. but it, it, using open source tools to help other people do business better, which is a great mission. I can. So, so talk about this. Here we are nine years ago, right. um, old Microsoft. Something happens, and now there's this shift, and what's coming to fruition, and, and how you think that looks. And maybe the best frame for that is your career trajectory and who you were and who you are and what you do. Okay. Um, so... 
It was interesting joining Microsoft nine years ago because, I mean, I've, I've been in the Microsoft camp for a very long time. However, I've been an open source guy in the Microsoft camp for a very long time. And so that has always put me in a weird place where I, you know, I have, I have a foot over here and a foot over there and it's, 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 it's an interesting place. Um, but it was interesting that they wanted to hire me at the time because of their current sales model. But I think that there was a shift starting to happen. And uh, around the same time, they hired uh, Phil Hack, who is now at GitHub. Um, but they hired him to do ASP.NET MVC framework, um, which is all done as um, uh, available and, and, and open and, and so on and so forth. The, uh, they hired uh, Scott Hanselman, um, uh, who is, I'm trying to remember what his title is now. Um, well, he was a big open source guy at the time. Uh, he still is. Um, he technically works for the ASP.NET team, um, but they just hired him to be Scott Hanselman and turn it up to 11. It was kind of an awesome job. Um, still is an awesome job. The, um, uh, but they started, you know, they started hiring a bunch of people that were of like mind where, you know, they were in the Microsoft camp, but they were all kind of open source guys. And, uh, so that was an interesting shift to watch. And really an interesting shift to be part of. Um, so I started out just kind of as a local evangelist in Michigan. And then I started um, uh, working more and more in the web space because that's really where my love and my passion was. And so I started working in that space. And uh, one of the things that came up was um, they, you know, Microsoft wanted to, this pre Azure, pre cloud, pre that kind of stuff. So um, they wanted to expand their market and their server shared. So um, they asked, you know, one of the things we started talking about is how would we do that? And I started looking at the PHP space and I said, well, tremendous amount of PHP is run by these top set of projects. We should go engage with them and make sure that they run really well on Windows. And a number of interesting things came out of that. One, I got to meet all these great people. Yes. When he says run on Windows. Oh, sorry. I got confused by this the other <laughs> night. Yes. Sorry, Windows, IIS, uh, SQL Server, and PHP. So the so. Windows, Microsoft equivalent of the LAMP stack. Mm. So WISP. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So go. Yeah, good, 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 good. So, um, uh, anyways, the um, so a number of great things came out of this. One, I got to meet all these great people here. So I got to meet Cal Evans. I got to meet um, uh, Michelangelo. I got to meet Raphael Domes. I got to meet you know a whole bunch of different great people in the PHP community. But I also got to meet a lot of the founders and um, core team of a lot of the really big projects, um, and that was that was great. Um, we also Microsoft started to shift as part of this as well. Um, one of my favorite moments, and I know that they're, they're a competitor to Drupal, but uh, I was working with the Joomla uh, community, who at the time was the second largest PHP, actually they were the second largest open source project in the web space. Okay. <laughs> and it was WordPress, and then Joomla, and then Drupal, and then pretty much everybody else. Yep. And, um, and, and everybody else included .NET Nuke and you know, all the, the other you know, web projects that were written in other languages and so on and so forth. Um, but it was kind of the top three were all PHP and then big drop off. So I was working with, with, with the top guys and I went and was working with the Joomla guys and um, they ran really fast with APC cache, which did not run very well on IIS. Okay, so uh, the IIS team had written a uh, APC equivalent called WinCache. And so um, I started talking to the IIS team and I started talking to the Joomla team and I made introductions there. And the IIS team actually wrote a converter for the Joomla team, uh, Joomla project. It's only about 100 lines of code, but it con did conversion between APC cache and WinCache. Great. That doesn't sound like a big deal, it's except a big, that it's a big enablement story, though. It's a big enablement story. And it means that in in the case of Joomla, in that moment, mm -hmm. a Joomla service provider could sell into a business that's running all Microsoft infrastructure, which is yes. which is a very common picture. Absolutely. So all of a sudden, um, the open source projects, not just Joomla over time, the open source projects get access to a much much larger marketplace based on the old Microsoft sales model. And uh, frankly, everybody wins. Right. Because your infrastructure stays relevant, we get more people to talk to. Yes, that's exactly it. So that was that was my approach when I reached out to people in the, in the PHP community and, and, and so on and so forth in these projects. The reason it was a big deal at Microsoft, though, was 
this was the first time that Microsoft had really contributed to a major PHP project. And we actually, the, the uh, IIS team, uh, they signed the JCA, the Joomla Contributor Agreement, which was a huge deal. I mean, it seems like a small thing to you guys, but that's a huge deal to Microsoft. <laughs> Being allowed to write open source code. Yes. And so, so we had the product team writing open source code and you know, writing code that they were going to give to a open source project, which was just phenomenal. It was, it was, it was amazing. Uh, and this is, this is better than us taking one of our projects and open sourcing it. It is taking and contributing to the community. And I, I particularly, that's where my passion area, um, uh, comes to be. Um, so anyways, that was a big deal made, you know, big splash, uh, and so on. Um, fast forward a number of years though. And now this is, this is a, a sentence that just, I mean, it took me a month to crock this in my own head, which is my full-time job is writing open source software at Microsoft. And so what I do, I the partner catalyst team that I'm the director of architecture for. Director of architecture, partner catalyst team under under developer experiences, which used to be known as the developer and platform evangelism team. Okay, so it, it yeah. Yay, corporations! <laughs> so, um, anyways, in short, we're in the evangelism department, so we are a outward-facing, community-facing group. Uh, but very specifically, we work with a lot of startups and uh, the very, very top edge of the uh, enterprise space. And we look at their toughest problems, and we go solve those problems with open source. So our team, we've got about 70 engineers, uh, engineers and architects, and we go work with the startups hand in hand. We'll sit down and we'll pair program with them. Uh, sometimes it will be a large enough problem that we'll take it off on our own and we'll work on, on it for a while and we'll come back and give them the code. Um, but everything that we do ends up in GitHub under typically an MIT or Apache 2 license. If it's original work that we're doing on our own, uh, or a lot of times we're actually working within open source projects. So um, nine months ago-ish, there was a number of startups that were starting to use Docker, starting to use CoreOS, or to use DS, and none of that ran well on Windows <laughs> or on Azure. And so my team went off and started doing a lot of core contributions to make sure that those things run really well on Azure. Right. And you were also, so that's an example of the other sort of work that you were telling me about where um, some interesting startup has a problem that is not directly their problem. Correct. And you might say, I've got your back, and you go off and actually work on the some other project that is their blocker. Yes, that's exactly it. And now sometimes it is it is uh, kind of core technology that they're trying to solve. So we do a lot of stuff with machine learning, machine vision. Um, we do a lot of core infrastructure stuff. We do... Um, uh, a lot of IoT stuff, so we're helping people, um, you know, from their device, you know. So, so I, I worked with a, a bunch of startups on IoT devices, and the stuff that happens on the device is their secret sauce. Yep. How they process the data on the back end is their secret sauce. Okay. How the data gets from the device to the back end, it's plumbing. This, this is a solved problem. And, and, and so, well, we solved it. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I mean, there are people. There, there, there are lots of ways to do it, but the 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 bit that's interesting and innovative about that what we did is um, the uh, you know we were well. We, Tim Park is on my team. Uh, he's one of the guys that wrote Nest. Yes. <laughs> so kind of knows his stuff. Um, but the big parts, anybody can just call a service. But the interesting part is, how do you do batching? How do you do um, uh, reliability with that? How do you do uh, uh, security around the device itself? So how do you know provisioning it, enabling it? Who has access to that device? Um, making sure that you have the right roles and security back to the. So we wrote a framework called Nitrogen, which is open source. It's open source. It's on no JS. GitHub. Yes. Yes. GitHub.com slash NitrogenJS. See, this is one of the big, my personal big concerns with the Internet of Things is uh, centralizing around open standards mm -hmm. now yes. before somebody, four-letter corporation, can take it over and declare a proprietary standard that, you know, mm -hmm. with lock it. Right. Super cool. So we're using, um, uh, we're using REST. Um, we also support MQTT and AMQP. Okay. So two fairly well-known standards and so on. Uh, and we wrote Node.js drivers for AMQP. We wrote, um, uh, yeah, anyways. Right, so the $64 million question, though, is it's 
it's fantastic mm -hmm. that you are doing this. It's really generous of Microsoft. Where's the, where's the, um, what's in it for Microsoft? What's in it for Microsoft? Yeah. So um, it's fairly simple. Uh, a, we want to help a lot of startups. And by helping a lot of startups, we will become known as a good partner to startups, which means that more startups will come to us when they want to solve problems, uh, which means that more of them will be using our technology in the end. Okay. It's, it's that simple. And right. now the thing is, is that we're helping them solve problems in their own tech stacks, right? So, you know, think, think about Azure, you can run anything. This is one of the big secrets, you know, and it's, it's, it's a very poorly kept secret, right? You know, we're, we're trying to get the word out and uh, some people have heard it and some people haven't. Um, Azure is not just Windows. It runs Windows, it runs Linux, it runs a lot of things. Runs Drupal. Runs Drupal really well. And, um, and and we have had teams that have spent a lot of time making sure that that is the case. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those, the Dublin Data Center, interesting statistic there is that 60% of the Dublin Data Center, uh, their workload is Linux. Oh. <laughs> cool. Which is an interesting statistic that people don't think about or, you know, when they think about Azure, they think about Windows. Yeah. And, and, but you can run, if you're running something on a web server, you can run it in Azure if you want to. Um, and if you can't, reach out to me, josh.homesomicrosoft.com, and we'll help make sure that you can. That sounds like a fantastic <laughs> shameless plug to just, well, yeah. to, to, <laughs> to wrap this up with. Thank you so much. It's been really great to meet you and, and talk with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Absolutely. It's been it's a pleasure. really interesting.